Welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, Ordinary People, Extraordinary Creativity. Here's how to get unstuck. I'm your host, creativity coach, Nancy Norbeck. Let's go. Author Elizabeth Morton was an actress before she started writing and has always loved the power of stories. She's also part of an acting family. She's married to Doctor Who's Peter Davison and stepmother-in-law of the show's David Tennant, and sometimes wonders if she started writing romantic sagas as an escape from all the science fiction in the house. Liz joins me to talk about acting and drama school, transitioning into writing, how her drama background influences her fiction writing, whether artificial intelligence can replace human writers, her new novel, and more. I think you'll enjoy my conversation with Elizabeth Morton. Liz, welcome to Follow Your Curiosity. Hi there. Hi there. So I start everybody out with the same question, which is, were you a creative kid or is it something that you discovered later on in life? Um, I think I was a pretty creative kid. Um, my mother was a, a piano teacher and her brother was a violinist and they were dancers in the family. So I had that on one side and, um, and my father was a headmaster. So I think that's that, um, you know, books were important on one side and performance on the other side. Um, so yes, I was, I mean, I remember I didn't quite know where to put this creativity if that's what it was, but I was, I got my first, um, I, I wrote a joke which was published in a magazine, in a comic, we call a comic called Bunty, which is, which was kind of a, a bit like the, the sort of children's young girls make of the day. It was a really bad joke, but I do remember <laughs> sitting in a dancing class and opening this comic and seeing my name written under this joke and thinking that was the best feeling ever. So yeah, there I was, dancing classes, writing jokes. Um, music was a big thing in, in my life. So I guess the answer to that is yes. And did your family encourage your creative side then? Uh, they they did, yes. I, I wouldn't say they encouraged it. It was a different time then, wasn't it? It, it, it was more that they supported it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I wanted to do... Um, drama lessons, dancing lessons that, that they, um, especially with my, my music, I was singing with a friend and I remember at one point I was singing in these rather kind of rough pubs in Liverpool, one particular pub in Runcorn where the ships used to come in and the sailors, um, would jump off board and visit the pubs. And one of them had to be the one where I was singing country roads age 14 or 15 and I do remember my dad actually being really um you know like a kind of bouncer we just were sort of what's going to happen next and it, it was it was pretty extraordinary looking back on it so he he was the kind of dad that would drive places and but they weren't they weren't I never had a sense of them thinking um I was kind of marvelous or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I, I never had that that feeling. It was much more. Um, it was much more. This is what you did, and if I was interested in something else, they would have supported that. So they weren't. Um, they weren't. Th 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 there was no sense of, oh, aren't you marvelous? Mm -hmm. Never, <laughs> never. That was not, it was just, if this is what you want to do, we'll, we'll support you. And there was no, in those days, there was no guiding you one way or another. So when it came to, when I went to drama school, it was, if you don't get into drama school, you'll, you know, you will go to university, have a crack at it. But it's, it's, um, there was no those days were different, at least in my family. You know, everyone just got on and and um, it, 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 there was no grand plan, mm -hmm. you know, to be a writer or to be an actor or anything like that. It was just, if this is what you love doing, why don't you spend your Saturday mornings, you know, going to yeah. classes? 
that kind of thing. That's a very long answer, Nancy. Sorry, that that's was a very okay. long. That's okay, uh-huh. and and that's still you know a far cry from that's a waste of time. You should be doing something more useful with your life. You know, whatever oh, yes. someone thinks yeah. more useful might be. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That 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 wasn't. Um, no, no. But I think if I had, if things had stalled and I wasn't kind of gamefully, I think it was all looking back and it was probably just expected that we would go into further education in somewhere. So some, some, you know, in some form. So if I hadn't got into drama school, they might have said, right, well, you know, think about university. So. Mm-hmm. But you did get into drama school. I did. Yes. Yeah. 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 So were you surprised? I mean, was it, was it more difficult back then or was it easier? I almost feel like it must have Would been you, somewhat easier, but maybe I'm wrong. Yes, yes. I mean, I was thinking about that today. I think um, I think there were less people who thought it was a great idea to be an actor, um, whereas now it seems it's so... Uh, it, it, it's not, it wouldn't be unusual in any way. Whereas it felt I was the only person that I knew who was trying for drama school, for example. Um, also, it was it wasn't it wasn't that it was easier, but you now there are so many. For example, there's 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 so many drama schools offer what's what's um, we have over here, I don't know if it's the same in America, foundation courses, which is a year training at a really prestigious drama school in order to get into another prestigious drama mm. school. You don't have to do it, but I see people doing it and they're not getting into the drama schools even after the foundation. So, it, 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 and also now I think there is more of a sense. I mean, there were some people who were, who'd come back and tried it for the second time when I did it. But now there's more of a sense that it would be very unusual to get in at the first time, first time, second, maybe third time. Um, whereas then I think if you didn't get in it the first time, certainly with someone like myself, it would have been, well, well, you know, you wouldn't be hanging around for another year and having another go at it. So, so I don't know, was it easier? I mean, with the, looking at the people that were in my um, in my year at drama school, I think probably, you know, we, it, it it was still fairly unusual that you would come. I mean, I used to do Saturday morning drama school. But it was, you know, it would. I don't even know if it. Yes, it must have existed, but the National Youth Theatre, for example, but many people do the National Youth Theatre here now as well as another. So you you feel like you feel like they're tooling up. Well, in in my in my day, I think we were the, those things weren't available to us. So it was more the schools took more, you know, more of a punt on you. I suppose we also had this awful thing. I have to say looking back on it, which thank God doesn't exist now. When we got there, no one told us. Now, I went to Guildhall in our first year. You know, we walked in to start in the first week and we were told um, 10 of you, a third of you will be um, kicked out at the end of the first year. And this is just a probation year, which of course was not, in health, uh, not a healthy way of running a school anyway. Um, so, so things like that were much harder than... You know, the, the world was a bit more of a crueler place in in one way. Mm. <laughs> you know, so so um, it's. I think that was probably very damaging for a lot of my peers who went through that, who didn't get through to the. You know, it was not a. It was it was unnecessary, and if the school had chosen them and they didn't come up to scratch it was the school's fault for making the wrong choice I thought anyway mm. thanks that doesn't exist now did that leave 
I can see where a comment like that would have either left you all feeling like there was a sword hanging over your head or left you all feeling like you were so competing with each other or possibly both. Yes, I'd say it was both. We had this night, I remember we called it Black Thursday, the night before we found out on the Friday, and you'd have to go up to the, you know, the second floor or where wherever it was, and it was like... <laughs> <laughs> the principal had a bowl of cherries and the sort of rumour was if you got offered a cherry when you walked into the room, you were going to be okay. But it was just terrible for people who didn't get through to have to go back to their parents and this, you know, or, or their families and say, oh, you know, they said I wasn't good enough. Because actually, everyone was so young and, and it, it's so... Um, you know, it's so subjective, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I, I think it was just a, you sort of got the feeling there was a perhaps, a, you know, where the business is really tough and we're going to toughen you up. There was, there was always that, that feeling at drama school, which I think that must have changed now. When you hear stories like the, the comment that you know, Alan Rickman being told that his voice sounded like the back end of a drain pipe or something, something like yes. that. I don't remember the exact quote, but and what was the man most famous for probably was his voice. You know, you, you hear things <laughs> like that all the time and how wrong people can be yeah. in those situations. And it's kind of like a cautionary tale that you should probably never put too much stock into something that that someone in a a yeah. teaching position tells you because they could be so wildly wrong. But I think when you're that young, it's very hard because you don't know if they're right or if they're wrong. You don't have yeah. that capacity to to judge yourself very well. And yeah. so, yeah. And I would think that it would have been hard for all of you to, to really build a, a good working relationship if you're all sitting there thinking, are you going to be the one who takes my place? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. No, it was, it was a kind of, Extraordinary thing, really, looking back on it. But, you know, uh, it, it, it's not like um, if you were at university and you hadn't handed in your work or, you, you know, that's one thing. But this was not, this was just whether you were, they thought you were good enough, you know. Mm -hmm. or, you know. Anyway, I survived. <laughs> I survived, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you it's, did uh, it, it, you know it 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 was yeah it, it, I, I think probably now I mean there's it, you know there's always been this that this thing again with the drama schools you go to you get into this drama school and it's so competitive and you I mean, and it could, it's, it, because it is so competitive, I just wonder how, how they can really decide, you know. But um, it, it, so that's in itself probably great luck to do with how you looked, how you look in comparison with the others, if they want mm -hmm. a group that will gel together, you know. Um, but then now I think there is that sense that people will come out and they'll think, you know, if they've done everything on this, you know, journey that they're supposed to do and then they come out and then suddenly find out there's not the work because there's never been the work and there never will be the work. Um, and maybe it's more saturated now. So that is, that, that is quite hard, I think. You have to be pretty resilient, resilient, and there's such a lot of luck in it as well. That's and I don't just... think they don't really. I shouldn't say this. I'm, I'm speaking from my experience in a, an MFA in writing program, and so right. I'm I'm guessing that it might be kind of the same. They don't, at least in in my experience, they they teach you all the writing stuff, but they don't necessarily teach you how to deal with getting an agent, getting published, getting dealing yes. with the rejection and all of that. So I'm guessing that that's yeah. probably the same with drama school. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, they have that, they have their end of year, you know, um, showcases and agents come along and 
they don't really, yeah. I mean, how can they in a way? Because it's just so, it's just so not, there's no hard and fast rules. This is the problem. At least you know if you were going off to be a doctor that you'd have <laughs> to pass these exams. If you got through, you would know absolutely everything that there is to know. And know it. but with with the arts, it's something mercurial, isn't it? Something sort of magical that and, and maybe speaks to one person and not to the other. Mm-hmm. You know, to to do with taste and fashion. Uh, you know. Anyway, right. I'm glad that I'm a writer now. Well, not so. <laughs> I'm thrilled. <laughs> I'm thrilled because I had a I had a wonderful time being an actor. I, I you know I really enjoyed it, and I certainly didn't have any grand plans. So whenever I got a job, I was amazed and thrilled, and thought that'll keep me going for another you know six months or whatever year. Um. But but with writing, I do enjoy the fact that you can, you know, you can sit and you can write and you don't need someone to allow you to do that, a third party. You can just do it. Mm. You know, it's you and the page. And then if any people like it, that's, a, that's um, the next part of the journey, getting published and read. But certainly you can you you your creativity is is um you 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 well i do feel fulfilled in my life because i have this thing that i love doing and i've had some success at and i can continue to do that um even if no one wants to <laughs> to read it at the moment they do which is really good. <laughs> um, but if I have a great idea, I can think, or I would think it's a great idea, it, it, you know, I can go, what? I, oh, this is, I'm going to write a short story and I'm going to, you know, see if I can, um, see if anyone else would like to work with me on this. It, it, it's, it's, it's much more, uh, act, acting It can be quite passive in a way, you know, you 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 wait you wait until people decide that they want you often you're you know part part of the if you're not leading a show often you're part of the final part you know the, the piece of the of the process so yeah well before we get too far from acting there is mm-hmm. one thing I wanted to be sure to ask you because I, mm-hmm. I went back and was not at all unhappy to watch some of the old Jeeves and Wooster because <laughs> it's one of my absolute favorites because um, I had discovered P.G. Woodhouse when I was in high school and then I was yeah. at university when that series came out. So it was like, wow, check this out. Yeah. Um, and while I was watching, I what kept asking myself in my you know while I was is how how did all of you manage to film that series without absolutely cracking up every 10 seconds <laughs> <laughs> well we did crack up we did crack up I mean it was that it was an absolute joy I mean of course when you get to the end of a long day and it's tired and you've been filming your sense of humor tends to Pray. <laughs> so you, you it, it was less of a problem at the end of the day um but it, it was so funny i mean they're so funny aren't they i'm amazed they haven't re- remade them maybe they're they're because it it's such a they're so kind of delightful really mm. and maybe actually because i think Stephen and hugh hugh laurie and Stephen fry were, were i can't imagine anyone doing it better than them so neither can I (laughs) yes so so that was a that was great fun that was a great show Uh, they did four series and I was in the last two I think so my character had been in it before but every new director wanted to recast Madeline I don't know to put their own stamp but I managed to 
just by sheer good luck, the director of the last series, series four, was in fact someone who who'd worked with me on a series called London's Burning. So he was very um he was very happy to continue with me, though he did again <laughs> wanting to put his own stamp. <laughs> he did say Oh, I think we should get, give her a brown wig instead of a blonde one, <laughs> which I never understood why. But <laughs> I think directors like their vision, don't they? They don't want it to be the same as the last person. So that was funny. Yeah. Good show. Yeah, I, I just, you know, it had been a while since I watched it and I thought, you know, every... I love these characters so much, but all of them are just so improbably clueless in their own ways yeah. And, yeah. and ridiculous and silly. And, you know, particularly Stephen and Hugh, but really all of you, yeah. just how how any of you managed to get the lines out without just completely falling to pieces. Yeah is beyond me. It's <laughs> yeah, yes. really amazing. Yeah. But, but we're all glad you did because they were just a marvel. Yes, yes. No, they were great. They, they, it was great fun. It must have been. So how did you transition into writing? So I, I think, well, as I said, I, you know, what my, my joke was published all those years ago. And I think, um, I just think that I was really um I, I was read i'd always written nancy you know, i'd always written so what happened was i had a friend i started to write so i had a friend and he suggested he was writing a drama and he asked me if i'd be interested in helping him and i said yes and then he suggested there was a writing competition and it was a short story competition it's first first I think I'd been trying to write a book I always had this dream to write a book and anyway I wrote this short story and and it won and I really tell anyone I meet or particular people I talk to about writing is I'm a real believer in competitions because they they validate your uh you know, your ideas and your fact that you can do it. Um, and they're very, they, they give you confidence. They also allow you to meet people within the business that you wouldn't meet, you know, often um, you'll meet other writers who then suggest agents. So so, um, so I wrote this story and amazingly it, it won. And then, and then I continued doing that I've always been a big believer just putting things in envelopes sending them off nine times out of ten nothing but then the you know the one time that it does you know come get to the top of the pile it changes your life so um I was very I'm very taken with the idea that you should you know we can you know it it, it gives you a bit of a it just writing is so solitary um that when you're able to connect with other people other writers um it's really uh heartening and and um it a p very positive i found it very positive so then i wrote a, a short play which also um uh didn't did it win? I can't remember. It either won or came runner up. But um, anyway, it then, of course, that was even more of a, it, it, it then um, was a monologue. It wasn't really a play because um, I'm more interested in writing prose. But as part of the prize, the play got put on and then I'd written two more monologues. And as a result of that, I had this play and then um the I then was asked to to be to to I know we did a reading of it and amazingly looking back on it the the director um you know you say oh have you who, who should we cast which is always very interesting and in the reading of that play 
we had um, Chewy Elijah Four was in it, um, and an actor called Jason Watkins and Anna Chancellor. You know, all these amazing actors who just come and read your play. I then was involved at the Royal Court on their Royal Court Young Writers Group. So th- this it was beginning. Things were beginning to move from acting. To, to my writing, I remember calling up my agent saying, oh, I'm very busy, my acting agent, very busy with my writing and thinking probably that was a mistake <laughs> because, <laughs> because, you know, it just, it, you just, um, and also I, I, was, I had two, one small child at, the mo- at that time. Um, so it was all very, my life was very busy. And I wanted to really continue with the writing that was important. Sure. Mm. Well, and I have to think that your background in acting and drama would have made that a really easy transition. Because I know yes. I've always thought that writing is kind of like acting all of the parts on page. 100%. I've always felt that. And, and um, you know, it's just like kind of, you know, he enters stage right. There is a, you know a fleet of ships outside the window <laughs> you know it's 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 just dis- it's describing what you see really uh, it, it's 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 and how people speak and what how you hear them speak just t- trying to successfully put that on on a page and make a story so yeah very much so yeah it's like you have the whole movie in your head yeah yeah, and you, I think you just, when you're working every day with story, you learn by osmosis how to, you know, structure something, how to keep, keep, a, keep a reader engaged and how to keep a sense of drama when it's flagging. You just, by instinct, you get to know that, I think, having been an actor. Mm. Yeah, I think you probably learn that skill even if you haven't been an actor but I think that you probably came into it with with all a lot of that baked in already which yeah 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 Yeah. maybe yes I think so and and you just don't know you just have yeah you have an instinct to to when what works and what doesn't I think that's that's really good really helpful to to have been I keep saying that to my sons because they do acting and yet part of me thinks just as long as you keep doing that then you're 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 acquiring a skill I mean whatever whatever world you go into that that is or you know or not but it is a it is St- structure P- writers will often say and I will say the same myself oh, oh you know I find the structure quite difficult but I think if you're if you've been an actor you 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 would do it instinctively you know I think that's an interesting point because when you're writing a novel you're not bound by the same rules that no theater and and film tend no. to have so you no. can kind of say i'm going to do this crazy thing whatever i yeah. way i want to and yeah. that's not always the best idea in the world yeah. structure is often yeah. your friend yes exactly so you know stream of consciousness there's fantastic novels but, but it's written in that style but i still feel that the most successful ones have a sense of story a kind of natural conclusion and a and a hawk, revelations, twists, reversals, all those things that we we love in story. You know, it's style might be different, but I think that they're the the you know the the foundation of any good piece of theatre or a novel or a poem. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, we're wired for a certain kind of yeah. story yeah. structure. Yes, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. So, did you do acting and writing side by side for a while, or did you kind of? Yes, say, I did. Oh, okay. No, I. 
Yes, I did. I did. And, um, but I actually was doing acting, writing and having children all this, all <laughs> side by side. And yes, and be, being married to Peter. <laughs> so, uh, yes, all, all taxing in their own way. <laughs> but I think that um, I very much, I, I was doing it all at the same time, but I got to a point, oh no, I remember acting in a play and thinking, oh, well, I'm not in this play much. And I was pregnant with Joel. I remember thinking, oh, it's all, it's all great fun. But we were, I was, <laughs> Kelly Brook was in it and she was going out with Jason Statham at the time. And he used to sit in the dressing room. And I remember thinking, oh, this is fine because I can chat to him and I can do my writing because he'd be backstage and it'll all be nice. And and then they said, oh, you know, our vision for this play is that all the characters are on the stage all the way through the play. I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> my plan that I would have this time on my own just writing. Anyway, so then I developed this I pretended I was reading a magazine, but I'd have been on stage and I had a pen and I'd be jotting down thoughts. And then one day the pen fell out in the mid <gasps> mid roll to the front. I thought, this is not good. Time <laughs> to make a decision. And anyway, the, the, my son came along and kind of made that decision for me because he was quite full on. And I thought, do you know what? My writing was taking off. I was writing drama then at the time and, um, I was doing writing a film for Channel Four, um, and it, it it was that was yeah I couldn't do that and it's funny when you sort of make a decision or to say you know I never actually rang up my agent and said I've decided I'm going to be a writer. It's just when you stop sort of pestering them. Often <laughs> the phone just never, never, ri- never rings because then you're you're so busy with this, mm-hmm. you know, in one area. Um. Anyway, I, I I was ready, and also Peter was working so much, and I, you know, waited quite a while to have children, and it would have been I would have found it Im- impossible if he was away. And you've got a two-year-old and you're saying, I'm going off to Manchester to do a play. Some yeah. people might have to do it. Of course they do and some people have to. Um, but I just was lucky to have found something else and was able to say, right, I'll, I'm going to really have a go at this writing thing. I was writing drama, which fitted in much more easily with a, with a young family because it's kind of very... You do it in in small goes, then you wait for your notes, and then that will come. But when you're writing a novel, that's different. I think you need longer stretches of time, especially as I write very early in the morning. So, you know, that's that's my kids are grown up now. So, writing novels suits me, writing prose. But I think at the time, probably writing drama. If you're writing short films or an episode of this or, you know, that, that short stories I was writing as well, that, that fitted in with family life. And I actually looking back, I think it probably was a good sort of preparation for building up the stamina to, to write commercial novels, which is what I'm writing at the moment. Very, um, you know, writing sagas and they're very much um a genre that requires stamina that's interesting because i wouldn't have guessed that there would be that much of a difference in you know how much time or concentration it would take to write those different kinds of things i i think the i think for me you know writing drama scripts it's much more collaborative Writing um, prose, you enter your own world and you disappear for, you know, into that world for for quite long stretches of time. But, but you know, especially when you're writing scripts, 
the script editors, of course, I spent a lot of time writing, developing ideas and, um, you know, as we all know, the, the, the kind of development, how ideas that would get picked up and then wouldn't fi- get the final commission, but they would get commissioned for, you know, for three episodes or, you know. So, um, and often I'd write with someone. So when so I went off to ITV and did a bursary, which was training up script writers who'd come from theatre. So um, that was involved me sitting in on, on a, a show called Coronation Street, seeing how that worked. So it is much more, there's much more chat. And when you're writing a book, I think you're, it, you know, you you. It's just because it's you're you're writing ninety thousand words. You can't have someone every step of the way. You know, mm-hmm. it's uh, you put in your first draft. You get your edit. You put in a second draft. It's it's that kind of feel. I mean, I wrote. Funny enough, for uh, um, <laughs> I wrote. I was amazed. An episode of a children's series is re- really good. I was just someone said, "Oh, do you fancy writing an episode?" Someone I'd worked with. Um, and you know it's preschoolers, and the incredible amount of care and attention and scrutiny over every comma, every bit. And I thought this is extraordinary. Really, you're writing a ten minute script, but because there are so many people involved trying to get it right, and you know that they, 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 I think TV script writing is very much um it's 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 very detailed and goes through very very many stages whereas when you're writing a novel i think you ha- you are trusted to i mean of course the editors are amazing when they come back and they you know they they are very detailed and very thorough um and brilliant but it, you just get you're just on your own for longer basically the process is, mm-hmm. is longer. So you're on your own sitting in a room writing for much longer than when you are doing with doing a script, in my experience, anyway. So when you're doing a script with that collaborative environment, does it, it seems to me like it could really easily feel disjointed because you have so many people in the mix. Does that? Well, it, that well I mean, it, yes. Well, I mean, that's, that's, Right, but of course, the more successful you are, the more people will defer to you. I mean, I was very much starting off, so I wasn't in that position. So I like to think I was starting off with my script writing, um, and then learned, and then then moved on to writing my novels. So put what I'd learned into my novels. But um, when, yeah, when you're when you're, I mean, I remember. I wrote an episode of, of we have a soap opera called Doctors and I suppose a bit like General Hospital and I wrote an episode <laughs> of that and once I'd written it was pretty much I think I got some notes and and I remember being quite surprised like no way would I, did I meet the director or the script editor or anything like that you then were handing it over you know for other people to fix or so it it is it it is, and I I think um, yeah, some people are better at it than others. I imagine. So you know, some people do. There's lots of people who could not bear the idea of sitting in a room for hours and hours writing. They'd find it lonely. They'd rather be writing a script with someone else and going off to lunch to talk about it, then doing another draft, then getting notes, then getting the director to look at it and you know much more um even the actors you know sometimes might have a part in it if you have an actor attached uh so yeah I think actually collab- being the collaborative process is fantastic probably when you're younger as well don't know about that but uh, but um the more you the more you feel you have your own voice and your own vision um that's hard to 
um, you, you know, you you want the. It's almost like you kind of you don't want to compromise that. So you sure. you you know you you want to be more proactive and more. Um, you know, you'll fight. I think I'll fight for it more in a in if it was something I really didn't agree with with an editor. I've not been in this position, but <laughs> say you were writing a novel and someone suggested you change the ending, I'd fight for it more. But I know I've been in that position. There was a script I worked on for quite some time, and um, it never really got off the ground. But it was good actually. But it was. Um, it, it, by the time that, you, you know, I had very kind of rather d forceful directors and producers involved, the ending ch had changed so much, it, you know, I barely recognised it. But I was the one changing it. I was all the time, you know, because that's just what you have to mm -hmm. do. If they wanted it, then. Um, uh, but I didn't may maybe because I was less experienced, but I did not feel I would. You know, I thought I felt my job was to deliver to them their vision, um, uh, or, or to, to to somehow come to a compromise so we were all happy. Whereas, I think when you're writing a book, you just you know, you have. A much clearer idea and it feels more like your baby it's giving birth to sending giving birth to your baby and sending it out into the world a script writing never quite felt the same I mean having said that when you're writing theatres theatres different I think that I wrote some plays that like just short plays 20 minute plays you know that that they were very much about finding your voice as well, and that, that that's that's slightly different. TV is is fairly, you know, it's not for the faint-hearted. I, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and as I say, there's a you can spend so much time, as indeed I did. You know, writing, spending many hours writing a drama, and, and then in the end. For whatever reason, it doesn't get picked up, or you know, you get so far along in the process, and then it's you know, when you, you if you write, a, I mean, I, I've always been published by what they call the you know traditional publishers, mm -hmm. the big five, Penguin and Pam McMillan have been my publishers, but now I'm absolutely amazed at how so many people just. Um, you know, the world of self-publishing, people are actively or, you know, e-publishing, actively choosing to do that over traditional publishing um, for whatever reason. I think monetary often, um, you know, uh, it, that that's interesting. I, it wouldn't suit me. It's very interesting to see what people are doing in self-publishing. Certainly a fair number of people have figured out to really make it work for them to the surprise yeah. of, you know, those who didn't think that that could be done. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's right. And I think this, um, that it's, it's really, the world is changing so quickly. And I mean, you know, there's a lot of conversation about AI and, you know, how that's going to affect writers and will commercial writers you know, would, would the new Bridgerton be written by AI? And but I, I, I happen to think not, because um, I don't think the, the creativity and and information are two different things. But it is it is fascinating, just from the technical side of um, you know publishing and the it, the, the e-publishing and and sort of taking control, especially. I know quite a lot of women writers who are, who you know, are very, you know, they feel they're steering their ship and mm. um, good luck to them. You know, it's amazing, really. Yeah. I, 
I hope that AI doesn't take over. I I don't want to bet on anything, but I, hope I can't not. imagine. I mean, I can't imagine. Can you? Would you really want to devote four hours of your life reading a book that'd been written by a computer as opposed to a person? Yeah, I. I don't, I don't know. know. Some of the things that I've seen come out of Chat GPT blow my mind, and I'm not sure what I to know think about that. I know. <laughs> well, funny enough, the other day I was thinking, I thought, oh, I thought I've got a lot of scripts that were never made. I thought, I wonder if I could just go into Chat GP, whatever you call it, and um, you get and put them in and say, uh, you know, can, can you, can you, um, adapt my book my this play into a book and actually it was quite funny because it was absolutely useless I have to say <laughs> it lost all sense of its you know how it sounded all sense it was it was just very very just I don't know it's really hard to put, put your finger on something as to why you want to read it and why you wouldn't but it mm-hmm. was very pedestrian. Yeah. You know, it was quite well written. It was very, it just lost all its color and life. I thought, oh, this is useless. And the, and I thought at the same time, you know, I just, it would be a lot, you know, quicker for me to just sit down and adapt it myself than it would to, you know, struggling, copying pages in and getting. But as, as my son keeps saying, in five years' time, that might be different. But yeah, it might anyway. Mm. So, are you are you firmly in the land of novel writing now, or do you think you'll ever write scripts again? I feel pretty firmly in that. I mean, that, that partly because I've got two more books that, that I'm working on that I've been commissioned to write. So, I've got two more books coming out. Um, I, I, I think I, pro- I mean, I think I came through, I did the whole thing, you know, the Royal Court, Channel 4, what was that thing, Coming Up, it was called, a series called Coming Up, you know, to, programs for writers, the Coronation Street. I, I just think that that's part, the, the journey has gone this way. It's always what I always dreamed of was to write books. And I love my books being in libraries and doing and the talks that I do and get getting to meet people on the back of that. So I don't know. Now, if someone came along and said, "Oh, we'd like to adapt your book," mm. it's you know any novel I'd written that would be different. But then I, I think it'd be really nice, wouldn't it, to just go. Let someone else do it, <laughs> but, but 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 it's that's all to do with what's fashion at at the moment. And I mean, my publisher did did actually originally um, my editor, sorry, um, commission all the Bridgerton books before they were on the TV. You know when they were. So there is, you know, there is stranger things can happen, but I think it's um, it's to do with. The, the sense of time and yeah I, I the problem with and in fact someone ha- did recently ask me to adapt one of the books into a script and I started and the problem is you know it takes so much time and um the brilliant thing about writing a book is if if anyone in TV or drama, w- w- was ever interested, you'd just say, well, here's the book, read it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're not, you're not in the world of, oh, well, I've got this idea. Well, I'll do a treatment and then I'll do a first draft. And then, you know, um, don't, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> yeah. Here's the book, read it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's probably people who are a lot better at doing that than I am as well. I think that's the other thing is that you have to, you know, sometimes it, it's, you, you, you have to divide it, share it out a little. I think if, if you're a novelist, I think it's probably 
quite wise to allow other writers to adapt your books rather than try and do it yourself. Because they will inevitably bring something new to it. Mm -hmm. I would. Mm. Makes sense. Is there a piece of writing advice that you got along the way that really was helpful to you? Uh, actually, I did. So many years ago when I was trying and, you know, getting rejected and sending, putting things in envelopes, I did, um, I had an agent and I, it, it was, it was kind of going a bit, it was, it, it was fraying around the edges a bit. And I wrote to a writer called Beryl Bainbridge, who's from the same part of the world that I am. I am. She's a Booker Prize, which is an absolutely fantastic British writer who sadly died now. Anyway, she wrote back to me amazingly when I think about it. I, I hadn't been published. She didn't know me from anything. And she she said, well, I didn't have a writer for 12, uh, an agent for 12 years. And I thought that was quite interesting. And she said, um, you know, don't ever be pushed around. If you have a story you want to tell and you have an idea of how you want to tell it, just commit to that and it will, it will find its place someday. It just will. The other thing is, um, I can't even remember who, who gave me this piece of advice, piece of advice. Um, but I think it is really important is just finish it beginning, middle and end, whether it's a short story or war and peace, a big long novel, beginning, middle and end, and then you can begin to write it. But if you don't finish it, you have nothing. So, you know, finishing is, is the beginning of the conversation. So, you know, sit down in a room, write your book, your short story, your film script, but don't think you can somehow blag it with, oh, I've got a great idea. You know, I've written 20 pages. <laughs> you just, and also, this is all sorts of pieces of advice, isn't it, Nancy? <laughs> this is supposed to be one piece of advice. Okay. But, um, but also, try not, um, try not to be too hard on yourself. Try not to be too sense of yourself and in the, in that you think, oh, this is terrible because it always is terrible when you start out and then you just go back and you change it and then you begin to think, actually, this is not so bad or this is pretty good. This is okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, striving to be brilliant and, and um, perfect is, is often the enemy, I think, of any good writer because it, it holds you up along the way. And so you have to be then brave. You have to put it out then for people to go, oh, this is not very good. But, you know, then you might be surprised when someone goes, this is fantastic. So that's my yeah. advice. Well, and if it's not very good, you figure out how to make it better. Um, you know. If it's not very good, I think you, yes, you listen to other people, you know, take their advice. Yeah, it's it's all. The more you spend on it, I think it will always get better. The more time you spend on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I totally agree with the advice to you know just finish it because until you have yeah. something down, you have no idea what you actually have. Yeah, yeah. You know what's in yeah. your head and what you actually put on yeah. paper could be two yeah. totally different things. Exactly. Yeah. So speaking yeah. of what's on paper, you have a new book out. You want to tell us about it? Yes. So I have a new book coming out. Uh, it's coming out in paperback on 7th of July. Um, but today it's out on Kindle. And um, I've written a series of books, which are 
about um, something that was known as, as Orphans of the Living, which is a, a rather sad um, little told story um, which took place after the war in the 1950s. Um, in my story, it takes it's set in Liverpool. They're all set in my hometown of Liverpool, but it's about children who, who whose families were not able to look after them either because they, their their fathers had been in the war and families were splintered. So children, in effect, that went into care, but then the authorities, thinking they were doing um, a good thing for them. Um, which feels sort of extraordinary when you read their stories, but would then send them, would, they were sent to places like Canada, Australia, um, um, New Zealand to begin new lives, but really they should have stayed at home with their families, impossible to do for so many, but this seemed the solution. Um, as always, I'm writing commercial uh fiction so they are even though they're very gritty they're heartwarming and romantic um and big as, again with my background in in theater and and being an actor I'm, i love a big sweeping dramatic story so the book that's coming out today on kindle um is the first of the three in the series and i'm writing it under the name Eliza Morton, because these are a slightly different um, standalone series to my other books. And I'm very excited, very excited for people to read them and then to get on the road in July and meet the people who read them if any of them are available to come along. So that that's nice. And what's the title of this first one? It's called The Orphans from Liverpool Lane. Okay. All right. Well, everybody can go check that out and keep an eye yeah. out for the for the next one yes yeah. yes thank you so best of luck with that thank you nancy thank you it's been nice to talk to you likewise thank you so much for coming and joining me today that's our show for this week thanks so much to my guest elizabeth morton and to you please leave a review for this episode there's a link in your podcast app and in it tell us about a time when a story was important to you if you enjoyed our conversation, I hope you'll share it with a friend. Thanks so much. If this episode resonated with you, don't forget to get in touch on any of my social platforms or even via email at nancy at fycuriosity.com and tell me what you loved. And if you're feeling a little bit less than confident in your creative process right now and you haven't yet signed up for my free email series on six of the most common creative beliefs that are messing you up, please check it out. It'll untangle those myths and help you get rolling again. You can find it at fycuriosity.com and there's also a link right in your podcast app. See you there and see you next week. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. Thanks.